research to discuss what makes planes and various other aircraft flyable, we need to know the pieces and parts of an aircraft and what they do to help the plane maintain flight. Later in the year, we'll discuss rockets in more detail, and you'll see many similar characteristics between the planes and the rockets and how they help to maintain flight and our forces of flight. And the aircraft are going to be used to control how that plane flies. One of the biggest things that we're concerned about is aircraft stability, and that's going to be helping us to return the plane to equilibrium, maybe after some type of disturbance. That could be something like a change in the wind or the pressure, or just the pilot let the nose dip down for a second, and those structures are going to help us to return to kind of our steady flight. And on the initial aircraft before the first plane, powered plane was invented, gliders, um, the plane was controlled not by mechanisms on the plane, but by shifting around the weight of the pilot or the direction of where the pilot was, um, and even sometimes where the passenger or the other storage on the plane was, where the center of gravity of the plane was. Once humans got on board, it was important that we were able to control this more reliably. So we incorporated some of these structures that you'll see from the earliest gliders or the first aircraft that the Wright brothers built to more modern aircrafts, the military plane that you'll see on the right picture there. And you'll see the same general components in all planes from the first invention of the airplane over 100 years ago. The five components, the five typical components of a plane, and we'll start with the wings. And the wing's primary job is to provide lift. And we'll get lift when we have sufficient airflow over the wings. The wings can be attached in, at the top of the fuselage, the middle, or the lower portion, um, and that's going to be referred to as high wing, mid wing, or low wing. You'll see on this plane, this example plane that we have here, there's one set of wings that's going to be called a monoplane versus two, one on top of another is going to be called a biplane. The wings can have flaps and ailerons attached to them, and we'll talk more about those, but those are used to provide some element of control on the wings. Flaps are going to be closer to the fuselage while ailerons are on the further edge. And flaps are going to be deployed downward um, to slow the aircraft and produce more lift, whereas ailerons are going to be used to help us change direction. The wings can also be used for storage. Oftentimes, this is going to be fuel. Wings are usually right over the center of gravity, and so that's a good place to put extra weight. Empennage. The empennage is on the back there. The empennage is a French word, um, like fuselage, which we'll talk about. And this is because a lot of the first developments in flight were happening in France. Um, the empennage's main function is to help with stability. And um, if you look at it, it looks something like the feathers of a bird, like the tail of a bird, or like on the end of an arrow. And the empennage is going to consist of four major components. The vertical stabilizer, that's the up and down part. The rudder, that's going to be the part on the back, um, the up and down part on the back that can go left and right. That's going to help with um, modifying uh, the position of our plane. We also have the horizontal stabilizer, that's going to be side to side, which has an elevator on it, which goes up and down, and again, is going to help to modify um, the direction of our flight. Uh, this is going to help us to maintain stability, change the aircraft's um, attitude. What does attitude mean? That means which way is it pointing or the direction, um, meaning up or down. Again, the main function is stability, but the secondary function is going to be maneuverability. What we're going to look at is the landing gear. The landing gear absorbs energy um, when the plane lands and also as we take off. It's going to support the plane, so it needs to be really strong. And so a strongest set of wheels is going to be placed under the center of gravity near the wings. Um, but sometimes we'll also see wheels located towards the rear of the plane. That's going to be called a tailwheel configuration or towards the nose of the plane, the front of the plane. That's going to be a nose wheel configuration. Nose wheel configuration can also be called a tricycle gear. Landing gear can be fixed under the aircraft or it can be retractable. Um, retractable landing gear is going to be more expensive. However, that's going to make the plane much more fuel efficient. So you'll see on your commercial aircraft, the landing gear is going to be retractable because efficiency is the name of the game there. They're trying to be as efficient as possible because they're traveling over much further distances. Commercial planes are also much heavier than most other planes. And so the landing gear not only needs to be strong, 
but sometimes they need to consider how much weight is on that plane um, and if we've taken off enough weight for it to be able to land. So one of the biggest things that weighs a lot on a plane is going to be the fuel, and we're using up a lot of that as we fly. So by the time we get to where we're going, it, the plane should be light enough to land. But if for some reason we need to make an emergency landing, you'll see that sometimes the plane will circle the airport um, so they can burn off a little more of that fuel before it's able to land. Power plant. The power plant can come in many forms. On this one, you'll just see a single propeller, an engine on the front of the plane, whereas on your commercial aircraft, you'll usually see um, multiple that are located on the wings of the plane. But this is a propulsion system to help us get up enough speed and enough energy in order to give us lift or to sustain lift, sustain flight. This is going to counteract our gravity and help us to stay in the air. So these can be electrical or they can be gas powered. That is the fuselage. Fuselage is another French word and its main function is to hold everything together. On the first aircraft, this was kind of a simple structural component. Now that's going to be more complex and we'll get to look at a picture later where it shows us the structure of our plane with um, something that looks much like our trusses. So this has to be able to support a lot of forces acting on it. Um, but the fuselage also now is used to store things, not only the cockpit for the pilot to sit in, um, but also passenger area or cargo area. Um, and so everything's going to be attached to our fuselage here. components of the empennage and the wings. And this isn't a great picture to see both the wings, um, but we'll see better pictures later. So the first thing is our vertical stabilizer. Like I said, that's the up and down part there. Um, our vertical stabilizer is bolted directly to the fuselage. So that doesn't move. And this helps us stabilize our position um, from left to, left to right. The rudder is on the back of the vertical stabilizer and that can move from side to side. And that's going to help us to move the nose of the plane to the left or to the right. It doesn't necessarily steer us. If we wanted to make a turn, we're not using the rudder for that, but it does help to point the nose of the plane in different directions. Next, we'll look at the horizontal stabilizer, like the vertical stabilizer that's bolted directly to the plane. Sometimes that's um, bolted or often is bolted as a little bit of an angle um, to maintain the best stability for that plane. And that's going to be dependent on the type of aircraft that it is. Um, and again, that's going to help us to maintain stability in specifically the up and down direction. The elevator is on the back of the horizontal stabilizer and that goes up and down. Um, that moves. The elevator, again, is going to be able to be moved in order to help us direct the plane, um, the nose of the plane up or down as we need it to go. When we look at the wings, you'll see the flaps on the inside and the ailerons on the outside. Like I discussed earlier, the flaps are closest to the fuselage while the ailerons are on the outside. Flaps can be full, spans, full span of the wings and so can ailerons, um, but in this one you'll see that it has uh, both of those separated. And the flaps, like I said, are going to be deployed downward in order to help with lift or you'll see um, or modify drag. You'll see when you're riding a commercial aircraft as you land, you'll see those flaps come up and you'll hear a loud roaring noise. And that's going to help to increase drag and slow down the plane as we're landing. Ailerons on the outside are going to be moved and rotated in order to help us turn the plane. empennage on another plane and you can kind of see the demarcation on the rudder and the elevator a little bit better on this plane. So see if you can identify those different components before I click on them. There's our vertical stabilizer up and down part, right? Horizontal stabilizer left to right part. Our rudder on the back and our elevator on the horizontal stabilizer. Um, and you'll see on the rudder and on the horizontal stabilizer, it's got this little tab in the middle of it. Um, the tab on there is called a trim tab, and that can be moved a little bit more relative to the rudder, relative to the elevator, and that's going to provide an additional level of control if we need even more maneuverability. Um, and so the tab goes up, the elevator goes down, the tail goes up, and the nose goes down. 
So I'll say that again. If our tab goes up on the elevator, that's going to cause the elevator to go down. The tail is going to go up, which is going to cause the nose to go down. So it's kind of like a back and forth and opposite. And so same thing goes with the tab on, on the uh, rudder. It's kind of moving in the opposite direction of which way you want the plane to go. Okay. It's on another plane. This is a real plane instead of the little sketch there. And so you'll see all the components there actually in practice. Um, on this one, you'll see that we have four power plants. And instead of those being located on the nose, those are mounted on the wings like I discussed. Um, this one, they're also pointing out the cockpit as well in addition to the fuselage. This is a little toy aircraft. Um, you'll see all the pieces again. And so hopefully you're starting to see that there are similar components um, amongst all of these different aircrafts. This is a model of a Cessna. And uh, Cessna is a plane that's often used when you're initially learning to fly. And so when we do our flight simulation, in your simulation, you're going to be flying one of these. that I should, talked about earlier. And so um, you'll see kind of the structure all together of, of the fuselage, putting the whole thing together. You'll see kind of those truss pieces uh, bringing together the shape of the fuselage there. And all of the components are going to be attached to this. Um, that's the inside of the wings. And on the inside of the wings, you'll see, again, some more truss-looking structures. Um, the parts that go uh, along the span of the wing are going to be called the spar, and the spar is going to help to distribute force along the entire wing, whereas the little, they look just like trusses, um, within the wing are called the ribs, and those are going to help to provide support for the wing. At, you know, as a wing gets longer, it's going to need more support, and that's going to provide support um, along the cord of our wing. The cord is the uh, front to back of it rather than the span, which is the left to right. You also see the wing strut on this plane. The wing strut is going to, again, help to distribute load, load and that's going to support the wing while it's in flight and while it's on the ground. Um, so when we think about the plane sitting on the ground, that's a lot of weight of the wing kind of pulling down towards the ground, and so that strut is going to help support it, pull it in. Whereas when we're in the air, um, there's going to be forces acting on the wing, pushing it up. That's our lift, pushing it up, and the strut's going to prevent it from going too far. Note that these struts are going to be acting under compression. Remember our compression and tension, so compression when it's on the ground. It's going to be in tension when it's up in the air. It's going to be pulling up because the wing is wanting to go up because of the lift acting on it up. Also, on some planes, this is generally on your commercial aircraft, the winglet. The winglet is that little part on the end of the wing that's kind of pointing up. And this um, has to do with some characteristics of lift that, again, we'll talk about later. but um, on the end of our wings, we can often have uh, vortices of air whipping around the end of that wing, and that's going to increase the drag on our plane. And so if we don't want to have as much drag on our plane, we're going to put this little winglet on there because it's going to improve our efficiency. So it can improve efficiency by up to 18%, 10 to 18%, um, because it's decreasing drag. The best aircraft is going to have no tip to it at all. On the tip, that's where the air is going to try to get around. Obviously, we can't not have a tip on the end of the plane. So they kind of stimulate that idea by putting the winglet on the end of the plane. Gravity a number of times. And, um, you know, that's especially important on our plane because there's a lot of forces acting on the plane. Um, on our commercial aircrafts, that's especially important. Uh, we don't want any accidents happening. So the baggage and the load on the aircraft, the passengers need to be placed in the exact right area in order to maintain the center of gravity um, for that aircraft. So that aircraft is going to have an expected center of gravity, and that's going to help the pilot to be able to control it in the best way possible. Stability, I've mentioned quite a number of times already, is an important characteristic of flight. And 
there's often a trade-off when we're designing an aircraft between the stability of the aircraft and the maneuverability of an aircraft. You'll kind of see two ends of the spectrum, stability versus maneuverability. You'll see your commercial aircraft, that's going to be your high stability, or that Cessna, that's high stability for the person that's initially learning to fly, versus um, something like a military aircraft, not, not your big transport, but maybe something like a a fighter jet or something like that is going to want much more maneuverability than stability um, because it needs to be able to move at a, at a moment's notice. A plane with positive stability is going to return to flight easily after a disturbance. Um, training, like I said, training in commercial aircraft are going to be very stable to help that pilot develop their skill, whereas fighter jets are going to be very maneuverable. Um, which makes it less stable and because that aircraft is built for the tactical value of being able to move quickly um, at the touch of the pilot. And so some balance of the qualities, these qualities of an airplane, that stability, that maneuverability, and that controllability um, are, are going to be necessary depending on what the purpose of that aircraft is and the characteristics of the aircraft. that aircraft attitude. And I mentioned a little bit about this, but the attitude of the aircraft doesn't have to do with what kind of mood the plane's in. That is the position or the movement of the plane. Where is it going? What is it trying to do? And that's going to be based on the three different axes that the plane can rotate around based on that center of gravity. So we'll look at the longitudinal axis that acts from the nose of the plane to the tail of the plane, the lateral axis, which is going to act from wingtip to wingtip, we're going to look at the vertical axis, which acts up and down through the plane. Axis is going to intersect at that center of gravity, and the aircraft has to be stable in order for us to have control around all of these axes. So not necessarily um, high stability, but just stable. It needs to be able to work around each of these axes in order to maintain equilibrium or maintain flight after some type of disturbance. Some planes naturally have their nose pointing down a bit, um, and if so, the horizontal stabilizer, like I said, might be bolted on at a certain angle in order to maintain that stability. So in order to take advantage of these three different axes, we need to be able to control around that center of gravity which direction we're going along each of these axes. different types of stability around each of these axes. So around the longi longitudinal axis, that's from the nose to the tail of the airplane, we're going to talk about roll. That's going to be the side to side. When we are looking at the lateral axis, that's pitch. That's is our nose going down or is our tail going down? Are we trying to point the plane upwards? Or are we trying to point the plane downwards? And then the last one is going to be around the vertical axis, that's yaw. And so if we remember the rudder, the rudder is going to help us to turn the nose of our aircraft to the left or to the right. Again, that's not necessarily steering it, that's just positioning the nose of the aircraft in one direction or the other. So the heading or direction of a flight is changed by rolling. So like I said, we're not using the rudder to steer the plane left and right, we're actually using the ailerons, the ailerons on the end of the wings that are going to cause us to roll and to make us turn. So you'll sometimes feel on a plane, if you roll in one direction, if the plane kind of feels like it's tilting, that's because it's turning. And so many people make the mistake of thinking that the yaw is what causes us to turn the airplane, but that's really just turning the nose. It's the roll of the aircraft that's gonna cause us to make a turn of the full aircraft. Um, many people make this mistake because they try to think about it sort of like driving a car, but planes are a little bit different. They're obviously up in the air, they're not on the ground, um, and so the yaw of the aircraft is going to um, align the aircraft, the fuselage, um, to fly relative to the direction of the wind, which is going to increase efficiency, um, as opposed to kind of fighting that direction of wind, because that's going to allow air to move smoothly along the fuselage, um, rather than kind of increasing the drag on the fuselage. So rolling can also be called banking of the aircraft. So if you wanted to turn left, 
you're going to roll to the left and it's going to cause the airplane to make a big sweeping turn around. Okay. So in order to make the airplane roll to the left, we're going to have to lower the right aileron, raise the left aileron, and that's going to cause our plane to roll. We're going to talk more about these figures here that are showing us the lift um, and the ailerons going up and down and how that occurs. But just know for now that if we want to go to the left, our right aileron is going to come up, our left aileron is going to come down. Um, if you think about that kind of like you're in a boat, you maybe are paddling a canoe. If you stick the paddle down into the water, that's going to cause you to pivot around that paddle down in the water. So when we put down the aileron on the left, that's going to cause us to kind of pivot around that left aileron. In order to move that aileron around, we are going to use the yoke. Um, and this picture isn't very good. And as we start to use our flight simulator, you'll be able to feel a little bit better how we do that. But in order to um, make the aileron go down, we're just going to turn that yoke kind of like a joystick to the left. And um, that's going to cause us to roll to the left a little bit. And most of these other configurations of the plane or the controls of the plane are going to happen based on the pilot's movements. They're not deliberately moving the flaps up and down or the ailerons up and down to a certain degree. That's just going to be based on their movement of the yoke as they control the plane. We're going to look at stability about our lateral axis. That's going to be pitch. And that's going to have to do with where is the nose pointing. If we point our nose down, we're pitching down. If we point our nose up, we're pitching up. And so if we want to descend, if we want the plane to come down, we want to land it we are going to first lower the power because that's going to reduce our amount of lift and we're going to start heading towards the ground um, but we don't want the plane to stall out so we don't want to keep the wings pointed too far up we're going to point the nose down a little bit and the elevator will pitch down a bit and that's going to help us head towards the ground again with the um, pilot controls they're not deliberately changing the position of the elevator they're just going to move their controller forward they're going to push it forward to pitch down. Um, and again, you'll see with your flight simulator, when you pull up on the yoke, that's going to help you to take off, whereas if you push it down, that's going to help you to land. Next thing we'll look at is the stability about the vertical axis. That's called yaw. And we can yaw to the left or to the right, and that's going to move our rudder to the left and to the right. So if we want the um, aircraft to nose to the left, we're going to position the rudder to the left. Um, now, in an actual aircraft, um, rather than using the yoke for that, for the up and down, the left and the right, um, you'll see some pedals on the ground. And again, the picture isn't very good here, but if you wanted to um, yaw to the left, you're going to push the left pedal away from you, and that's going to cause the rudder to rotate. We're just going to have a summary chart of the different axes that we're moving along, and the motion that's associated with them. What portion or which component of the aircraft is going to affect that, what the specific control on that component is, and what the pilot needs to do in order to make that motion happen. So we want to start to associate these different terms with one another, um, longitudinal or roll being controlled by our wings and the aileron, the lateral or the pitch being controlled by the horizontal stabilizer and the elevator moving up and down, and yaw, our vertical position, or about our vertical axis, based on our vertical stabilizer and the rudder attached to that moving back and forth. So you'll see different types of airplane designs, like we talked about earlier, but they all have these similar characteristics that we talked about at the beginning. Um, and each of these aircraft is going to be designed for a specific purpose. You'll see some, like the top left, have the wings on top. That's going to be a highly stable aircraft versus the one below that is going to have the wings on the bottom. That's going to be more maneuverable. You'll see the white plane in the middle. That's got, um, looks like two sets of wings. That's called a canard plane, where it's got its main wing on the front of the plane. You'll see on the top right, those yellow planes. Those are biplanes. You'll see our army planes, which have uh, a number of rudders in the back that are going to provide more control of our airplane. And so, um, all of these things are going to be important 
for what we're trying to accomplish with our airplane. It's one of the things that we talked about that are going to affect the performance of that aircraft. We have the high wing, which is going to be our most naturally stable position in both roll and pitch. Our mid wing is going to be kind of equal force, regardless of whether we are um, up or down. Sometimes the mid wing is going to be used for our kind of show planes, any of those stunt kind of planes, because they're right in the middle. So regardless of whether that plane's flying upside down or right side up, um, they're going to have equal forces acting on that. And then the low wing, um, like that bottom picture, is going to have the highest maneuverability. That's our military planes. That's our fighter jet. has the most lift. Um, you'll notice in this, because the wing is above the cockpit, the pilot's able to see the best. There's no obstruction in front of it. Um, the center of gravity on this plane is going to be high, and this avoids turbulence happening over top of our wing because there's nothing kind of in the way. Lift of the three wing locations, um, but again, this is going to be really good for those aerobatic aircraft, the high performance, because it's going to give us equal amounts of lift whether we're upside down or right side up. Wing is going to have that median amount of lift um, between the mid wing and the high wing um, because the airflow is continuous with just a little bit of interruption. But we're going to have extra ground effect. This is something we'll talk about more later, but you get a little extra lift if you're coming straight off the ground um, because that airflow is going to act against the ground. However, this pilot's not going to have a lot of downward visibility because the wings are in the way. However, if you're a fighter jet, that may be important because you don't necessarily want to see the ground. You might want to see up because that's where your enemy is. Um, this plane here that you're looking at is less than 250 pounds, so that's an ultra light plane. Aside from the position of the wings, low, medium, or high, we can also have different kind of configurations. That biplane that has two wings, that just means that they're stacked one over top of the other versus the canard. Canard's another French word. You'll start to see more of that. Um, and this is going to have a significant amount of lift from a secondary pair of wings. So it's going to have in this one that main uh, wing in the front and then a second one kind of right behind the cockpit there. Um, but it doesn't have a horizontal stabilizer on the empennage, sort of like your traditional airplane does. Why biplane? Well, because it's going to generate more lift. We'll come to find out that uh, more area on your wing is going to give us more lift. And so if we have a biplane, we're going to get um, more wing, more lift. However, that's going to give us more drag. So this probably isn't going to be the best for efficiency, right? wings provide uh, additional surface area, which is why they're going to be good. And the center of gravity is going to be positioned further backwards. So this is going to give us better control in pitch. That's our up and down, um, which may be beneficial for certain uh, types of jobs for, for an airplane. The landing gear for this specific plane is, do you see the bend in that front wing? That's where our landing gear is. Um, and that helped to reduce the drag on this plane because we already... Um, needed to have landing gear on there somewhere, so let's put it behind the wing where it's not going to um, produce any additional drag. Um, a canard is theoretically more efficient, but uh, different designs are going to be designed for specific functions, and so some canards may be more or less efficient than other traditional planes. We'll see different configurations for the vertical stabilizer. We'll see that twin vertical stabilizer, triple vertical stabilizers, or the V-tail. Those twin vertical stabilizers um, are just outside of the engine. The jet engine there, you'll see in the middle, was actually melting the stabilizer on the original model of this plane. So they just moved them out of the way. It gave us the symmetry of the stabilizers, but it also added a lot of balance. And the second one down, that triple vertical stabilizers, helps the plane to move in a straight line. You'll see that's an army plane, but that's not going to be our fighter jet type of plane. That's going to be for transport. Um, we want to move long distances um, in a straight line where we've got an intention. Then, you know, that's not our fighter plane. That's something that needs to stay in the air and move relatively straight for a while. So maybe that's transport. Maybe that's we're searching for something. Um, we want to know where we've been, so we want to move in a directly straight line. And so that's going to help us um, with stability. The V-tail is something you don't see very often, but again, it gives us that symmetry and balance in our airplane. 
those twin vertical stabilizers are going to additionally these triple vertical stabilizers good yaw control um, but they may limit some of our other features remember that um, our stabilization um, is kind of a balance so again that may not have a high maneuver The power plant is going to affect how much lift we can provide to our aircraft. So this first one we'll look at is the tractor power plant, and that's going to be right on the front of our aircraft. You can see the entire thing is exposed, so you may think that's going to increase a little bit of our amount of drag occurring on the front of that aircraft. The second one down is a pusher power plant. So rather than um, being out front, that's going to be behind, and that's going to be pushing the aircraft forward. Um, and then this last one, you'll see a variable direction power plant. So that's going to be able to act in different directions depending on what we need. If we need it to move backward quickly, it might push in one direction versus if we wanted to go forward, it might push back. Uh, this is just a closer zoomed in view on this tractor power plant. You see the engines on the outside, which are actually pretty cool to look at, as well as our propeller. Uh, don't touch, especially not when it's moving. The, our uh, pusher power plant, so you'll see the engine and the propeller in the back of the plane rather than in the front. Uh, if you'll notice, this is that mid wing that we were looking at earlier that's really good for um, our aerobatics. So our engine and our propeller being in the back um, pushes us forward quickly. Power plant. This is the uh, Harrier jet, this example is here, and that allows it to rotate its thrust so it can either go downward facing for vertical takeoff and landing, or it can move it aft facing to propel it forward. Landing gear, we have some different types of landing gear here. You'll see the oleo strut, the tricycle, that's the three. Um, we'll see the floats if we ever needed a water landing, those kind of pontoons on the bottom are gonna be important. Um, you also see the tail dragger, so it's just got one little wheel in the back to prevent that tail from hitting on the ground. Here is a very complicated portion of the aircraft um, that is, consists of the oleo strut, the brakes, the tire, the rim, the axle, and all of these are going to work in conjunction with one another and be specifically designed for the type of aircraft that it is to perform the function that it needs. So if it's a heavy, big heavy plane, it's obviously going to have heavy duty landing gear. You'll see in this example here, it is actually retractable. You can see where it'll go up into the wing up at the top. Um, and these oleo struts are a pretty complicated um, mechanism. And so that's a whole section of aerospace engineering is just designing that little piece of the plane. So have these uh, landing gear, which are the floats. So those will allow us to land on water. You got this really interesting zebra print here. Um, this other one down at the bottom with the double uh, pontoons. But notice that one also has some wheels on it. So it could land on grass, as you see in the picture, it's in the grass. Or if it needs to, it can land on the water. Um, you'll see our kind of conventional aircraft that has two main wheels in the front versus our tail wheel in the back. And the tail dragger um, minimizes the size of just the one wheel, and that helps to reduce drag if it's not retractable. Just making it one and putting it in the back is going to reduce our amount of drag. But the um, pilot, as he's taking off, kind of needs to lift up the nose just a little bit. There's no wheel on the front in order to help it take off, so it's going to kind of swerve back and forth and balance on that back wheel. The tricycle gear has the nose wheel in the front and it's got the main gear in the back. Um, this one obviously isn't gonna have to do like that tail dragger because it's got enough balance between the three wheels to stay on them the entire time that it's taking off. Examples of specialized landing gear. So we have the rough field landing gear at the top and the soft field landing gear at the bottom. And again, those are gonna be for specific intentions or specific aircraft purposes gear is going to have smaller wheels which allows us to have larger shock absorbers um, you'll see that that's a very tall landing gear purpose being to maybe land in somewhere where there's tall grass or some sort of obstruction so that that propeller isn't going around inside of the grass so that might be for somewhere like the savannah and so that's going to help us to absorb impact on rough ter terrain um, and again the propeller is going to be above that tall grass
windshield landing gear. And this is going to have large wheels to minimize sinking into the terrain. So this might be in the Arctic or Alaska or Russia where there's permafrost, um, you know, somewhere where they're expecting frequent amounts of rain, things like that. So the aircraft size is going to, again, affect our performance. So we're going to look at the fuselage size, the engine size, or maybe that specialized configuration. Here you'll see a very large aircraft. Um, this is the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy. Um, and in the next picture, we'll see the, the scale of how big this aircraft is. Um, and also notice this one's unique in that it has flaps on the front end people standing next to this aircraft. It is huge. And the power plant of this aircraft. Um, so that just gives you a scale of how large it is. And it's absolutely dwarfing the pilot. Um, you'll see the swirl on the inside of the power plant. And you might be wondering what that's for. Um, that's to help someone know whether it's spinning or not uh, when they're just looking at it. So if you can see the swirl, you can tell that it's not spinning, whereas if it was spinning, you would not be able to see that swirl. So that might be a safety mechanism. Now we're going to look at this Boeing 747, which has been modified to strap a space shuttle to the top. Um, and this is the final flight of the space shuttle Endeavor when it was landing in Los Angeles in September of 2012. So this plane was specifically functioned so that it could strap something to its top. instrument panel within an aircraft and that can be everything from this simple instrument panel to just our general aviation instrument panel and that's going to have the same six um, devices on it or instruments on it we call that a six pack because it's the same six instruments that we use for all of flight are your references if you want to look up any of this information as always the powerpoints are available in your pltw account